This was another great episode of Game of Thrones, and honestly, I think Peter Dinklage as Tyrion may be the best actor on the show. Game of Thrones, Season 4, Episode 6, The Laws of Gods and Men. <laughs> Woo! Well, hello, my brothers and sisters and Baratheons and Lannisters and Starks and all those that have a claim to the throne, the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. I, of course, am Jim, here to bring you another review on just the awesome and mesmerizing, tantalizing tale uh, that is Game of Thrones. Um, th this episode, and, and really everyone this season so far, has impressed me in one way, shape, or form, sometimes several. Uh, there's been very, very few scenes that I felt like were slow or didn't uh, serve an overarching purpose in the storyline uh, to move plots forward and things like that. As a matter of fact, the only complaint that I can come up with is that because it's only a 10-episode season... There is so many different threads and so many different characters and so many different stories to follow that oftentimes you, one goes forgotten and, and not seen, doesn't have screen time for two or three or four episodes, uh, which was the case in one of the first uh, one of the first scenes in this week's episode. But anyway, we're going to get right into it over here, and I'm going to tackle it like I did last week and just go pretty much scene by scene as far as location by location. That seemed to work out well, and, and I wound up getting some very positive messages and comments about that. So. Ultimately, Game of Thrones can be very daunting to talk about, to review, to recap in any way, shape, or form just because there is so many different names, so many different locations, so many different things to follow. So every, uh, the, 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 the episode opens up with, um, with actually with uh, Stannis and, uh, and Sir Davos, and they're, uh, they're heading in to, uh, to Bravos. And Bravos is actually uh, across the Narrow Sea, and it's, uh, and it's in the, uh, uh, the kingdom of Essos. And uh, and I believe it's one of, considered one of the one of the free cities of man. But that's where the Iron Bank is. And wonderful panning out, just great shot of, of them when they're coming on their coming in on their boat of this giant colossal colossus type statue, um, just just hanging over there. Um, and then they got to go down through beneath its legs. I thought because my 13 year old son who watches with us too, you know, he was like, oh great, look at the statue with the ding-a-ling hanging there, you know. And I said the only thing that would have been better is if they would have actually made that into a fountain, like a little waterfall, as you were passing into Bravos. But anyway, all joking aside, um, the the scene where they actually get to go into the Iron Bank, I think was was really well done. Uh, Stannis, who is uh, is 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 a king to be, or or you know claims you know, claims to have this birthright to the throne, but is is obviously a, a lord and everything else is made to wait. The Iron Bank doesn't really give a shit who you are. Uh, he's waiting for hours, him and Sir Davos, you know, and Sir Davos is trying to kind of calm him down and everything like that because he has some experience with the Iron Bank from back in his smuggling days and everything else. Anyway, uh, these these couple of characters wind up walking in, and the one guy who does the, the talking for the Iron Bank, this kind of smarmy character or what have you, basically says, hey, listen, we deal in truths and absolutes over here. You may, you know, claim that, because, you know, Castana says, you know, I'm the one true king in this net. And he says, listen, he says, Tom and Baratheon is the one who sits on the throne right now. Joffrey sat there before him. Tywin Lannister is obviously running things. We know that. And, uh, and it doesn't really matter whose blood is in it and who this... What they explain is that, you know, birthrights and all these other things that can be muddled and confused, we don't deal in any of that. We deal in the absolute cold, hard truths and facts of things, you know. So they ask him, they say, how many, you know, how many men do you command? Well, 4,000. How many ships do you have, you know, including the one that you wrote in, not the ones that are at the bottom of, the, of Blackwater Bay? Well, 35 or 37, something along those lines. Okay, so what do you produce where you're at over there? Uh, you know, at Storm's End, I think is that. What do you what do you produce as far as you know wheat and and this and that? You know, basically like food and the and the sustenance for this this small army that you have that you're going to attack King's Landing with and take over. And uh, and he they, they says nothing, you know. And so the guy basically says, "Sorry, bud, we can't help you." Okay, so very much like real banks in the sense of, hey, you know what? You don't have the the credit or the collateral that we're looking for. You're not the ideal type of customer. Too bad, sorry, we don't give a shit about your birthright. So Sir Davos comes in and actually has a real nice scene where he goes and, and winds up talking to them. He pulls off his right-handed glove and we see that uh, he wind up, uh, his fingers were amputated, they were taken off. And that was, uh, that was uh, his penance, I, I'm sure, um, you know, for what he did at the end of last season, um, letting one of uh, Robert's bastards go, Gendry. 
And uh, and, he, and he says, you know, and he explains and does this real nice speech about, listen, when all is said and done and all the dust settles, uh, when, when Tywin Lannister, just humor me here for a minute, when Tywin, Tywin Lannister is the one running everything, how old is he? And they say, well, he's 67 or 68, which is probably really old for this particular time period and whatnot, that he hasn't been killed or by some sort of disease or pox or what have you. Sir Davos goes and points out, he says, once Tywin's gone, Who's going to be in charge? What some some kid that doesn't know how to how to run everything over here? Who's who's going to run the kingdom? You know, Stannis is is your best bet to actually go and pay back the millions that the crown owes, right? Um, so that you know, so that that's what we're saying. They're basically saying we're going to go and take on that debt. If you lend us some more money, we're going to go and also pay. We'll pay that back, right? Because we're good for it, you know. And Sir Davos holds up his finger. He says, "Stannis, if anything, he's a fair man, and he pays his debts, right? He took my fingers. He pays his debts." And uh, and he winds up talking them into into lending them uh, lending them the money, obviously, to fund, uh, you know, him him putting together an army, probably getting some cell swords, more ships, what have you. Uh, so I thought it was very cool because Stannis has kind of just been since he was crushed at Blackwater Bay. He really, he has. He's kind of been relegated to back of the bus type of stuff. There's some weird goings on with, uh, you know, with the, the the red red woman and everything else, and her all her pokey voodoo type shit to the the Lord of Light and everything else. But for the most part, Stannis has just been sitting in the most depressing area of the world because Storm's End always just looks depressing, and it always looks like it's gloomy and rainy over there. It's kind of like the Iron Islands, you know. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it always just looks like, oh my God, you, know, you just want to hang yourself when you see it, you know, or just grab a razor and you're like, oh. <laughs> So anyway, um, so we wind up finding out actually through a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool little event. We wind up seeing that guy, uh, Sel what is his name? Sel Selador, Sel Selador, Selador San, I believe. And that was the uh, that was the merchant slash pirate uh, dude that um, kind of almost reminds you of like a, like a Jamaican or a Caribbean type guy that uh, that had had sailed with with Sir Davos and uh, and wound up actually taking him back and bringing him back when he when he found him out on that rock <laughs> last year and bringing him back to Stannis. And he's sitting here butt naked with a couple of, you know, a couple of prostitutes, a couple of whores uh, in this whore bathhouse type place. And Sir Davos comes in and basically that's how we find out that he got the gold because he goes and he just lays them out with some gold there and says, be ready to sail tomorrow morning. Uh, you know, you're, you're being rehired, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And then he also goes and he says, and I thought this was great because the guy's married, but obviously even though he's married, you know, clearly that doesn't really mean a whole lot in, in these times because the dude's sitting here with two, you know, two prostitutes in the, in the tub. And he goes and he says, there's a whole chest of it that I went and I left back at your house with your wife. And he's just like, oh, God, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> so so that's how the first scene plays out, and uh, or the first location, I guess you would say, plays out. So now we know that Stannis is well-funded, and, uh, and, and we know that he is going to actually be able to go and amass and raise a larger fighting force to go and eventually attack King's Landing. Uh, that's what we're assuming uh, to come back and attack again, or however he goes about it. He's now back. Uh, he's now back in command, so to speak, and he's in the driver's seat and really has a, a fighting force to be able to, you know, to kind of move along with him. The next scene, actually, and I thought it was it was portrayed and it was played out very well. If you remember uh, Yara, uh, Theon Greyjoy's sister, uh, at the end of last season, so six, seven episodes ago now, she. Uh, vowed to take her where her father wasn't going to do anything when the penis was mailed to him or <laughs> sent to him, you know, um, by uh, by Ramsey Snow. And uh, he was just like, whatever, he's not my son, you know, and he's not even a man now. And Yara was like, you know, I'm going to take the fastest ship and 50 of our greatest warriors and we're going to go get him, right? And then we haven't heard shit from her. And this is one of those things where it was very frustrating because like you know, i almost forgot about it when i all of a sudden seen i saw her and she gave this rousing speech about you know what they've done they've mutilated their prince and blah 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 and she's got the, and they're gonna go and they're gonna attack the dread fort right where ramsey snow is and it was a cool scene that was portrayed because ramsey has got to be one of the coolest villains ever and it came at a great time that he's getting more screen time because regardless of what you think about joffrey joffrey was an excellent character in the sense that he he gave you something to to hate to root against you know and now that he's gone you don't have as much of that hatred at least in king's landing for him because there's nobody there that's filled that role ramsey is doing his best to fill that role as just crazed psychotic madman right and uh, and he does a good job of it right he's getting <laughs> he he's with who, whoever that he's with and getting getting his brains fucked out for lack of a better word uh, for, for lack of a better term, 
Uh, and this is all while uh, Yara and and their you know their group and what have you are, are attacking the Dread Fort at night. And so they come up over the and it was a very cool scene the way it was played out. They you know they're they're coming up over the you know up over the battlements, the parapets, and they're taking people out and this and that. And they wind up actually locating um, where, where Theon is being kept. He's being kept in the same room, the pens where the dogs are being kept, right? So that's how we know that Theon, who is, refers to himself even now as Reek, has been a completely broken man for a while ever since he was mutilated and everything else. And, um, and is now, I mean, is being treated like an animal, right? So they break, they bust in there, and she's trying to get him out, and Theon is is so mentally warped right now, there's nothing of Theon left, really. Um, he, he just, he, he thinks that when Ramsay went and took him out of there and pretended like he was rescuing him and everything else, and then only went to go and re- lead him back to the dread fort, it was a total mindfuck. And everything that's happened since then has been a bunch of psychological torture and warfare that has conditioned Theon to truly think that he is this reek, he is this piece of garbage, he is this... But when she's trying to rescue him, his sister, he doesn't even recognize her. He thinks that he's being played for a fool again and that he's going to be attacked again, you know? Uh, and, and then maybe even mutilated worse or tortured worse. So as this is all happening, right, Ramsey Snow goes and busts in and he's got all these scratches and shit all over him. So apparently he likes it rough because the girl that was banging his brains out apparently was like whipping him and slashing him, you know, whip me, beat me, make me bleed, kinky sex is all I need. I don't even know where that came from. But anyway, um, so he comes in shirt off and he's just like, oh, this is great. You know, he just got laid and now he gets to go and just hack some people up. So this dude is truly psycho, man. I love it. Absolutely love the character. So there's a great fight scene, you know, that's played out where everybody's, you know, and Ramsey's just cutting through guys, cutting through the Ironborn left and right. So Ramsey's crazy ass winds up going and saying, hey, how fast can you run? And he goes and opens up the the cages for the hounds, right, to run after them. The next scene you see is Yara and some of her, uh, some of the Ironborn that are still left getting back in their boats in the middle of the night. And they're like, well, what happened? Where's our prince? You know, where's Theon? And she's like, Theon is dead. <laughs> they just take off. And I was like... For someone who is so committed to bringing her brother back, um, I understand that, yes, he's a broken man and everything else, but, I mean, don't you think that maybe conking him on the head, knocking him unconscious and pulling him out of there or something would have been better than just leaving him to this this pitiful existence? Even pulling him out of there and then slitting his throat when he woke up if you couldn't get through to him, I mean, for Christ's sakes, that would have been more merciful than what she did, which was essentially just leaving him... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to whatever, you know, whatever uh, Ramsey's devices may be. And this guy is certainly crazy, right? Bad shit crazy. So Ramsey, <laughs> so then we see a scene where Ramsey afterwards now, you know, because this guy's obviously, I mean, he's got, he's gotten, he's just totally gotten off on this. He's gotten laid and he's gotten to go and slaughter some people. So he's happy. So the next morning you see him going and, and telling Theon that uh, those people that were here last night were bad people trying to take you, Reek, and, you know, and this and that. You can see that, that Theon is just broken, that he's his pet, you know. And uh, so he winds up going and saying, here, you know, I've drawn you a bath, right? Now, Theon, remember, this, this, he's been tortured and beaten and, and everything else. And uh, had, had his dingling cut off. And he's been sleeping and living in the same pen as the dogs. Well, the same pen, same area as the hounds of these dogs. So Theon probably hasn't had a bath in weeks, if not months, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what did this guy do? Like, put razor blades in the bathtub or something like that? Or is he bathing? And, like, he's going to get in the bathtub and there's going to be, like, heads of the Ironborn or it's going to be, like, blood or some shit, you know? Because Theon's kind of freaking. He doesn't want to take his clothes off or nothing. And then as he's going and taking his clothes off, I'm like, oh, please do not show us a shot of his crotch where there's no penis, okay? Because that's just too much, okay? Honestly, there's titties all over the place in Game of Thrones. We know that. Uh, there's ding-a-lings all over the place, too. I've seen probably no less than, like, ten dicks in this, uh, whether I wanted to or not, in this particular series. I don't need to see where the guy's dick was before he was mutilated with, with clever CGI. And thank God, they just kind of pan down close to that, and then you see Ramsey kind of look at him, like, happy with his work, with what he did. And then Theon eventually gets in there. The bottom line, and the, and the really the, the whole point of this scene, though, was for Ramsey to go and uh, and he's going to have Reek play Theon Greyjoy. He's going to act as if he's Theon Greyjoy, and is going to help him be able uh, to take back the fort uh, Moat Kalen, which uh, which obviously the Ironborn have right now, and that was what uh, his uh, his his father, uh, uh, Roose Bolton, had tasked him with a few episodes back, saying, "Hey, listen, you know what? 
go ahead and take this creature with you. Do whatever you got to do. Go get back Moat Kalen because if he can take over, if he can take that back over and push the Ironborn back, he's going to be the Lord of, of Winterfell, you know. So providing too, obviously that uh, you know that uh, the other Stark heirs can be taken out, but but that's besides the point right now. So a uh, very cool scene, but very just kind of grisly too, you know. And just I, I didn't. I don't know. Some of it, man, it's just like seeing Theon so broken and everything like that. It was uh, it, it, he, this guy Alfie Allen, uh, who plays Theon. He he plays the character so well, you know. And he, he went from this kind of like pompous, like self entitled prick, to like this, you know, I'm trying to just fight for my family's honor and everything else in season two, and then in season three, just tortured and beaten, mind fucked, and just, I mean, it's just so it's it's a real terrible progression for him, you know. And and his his arc has just been oh, gut wrenching. So then we wind up moving on, and we go back to uh, we go back to, to to Marine, right? And but before we get to Marine, we wind up going and we see this this wonderfully shot uh, uh, thing that looks like something out of the Bible or what have you, where you've got uh, there's a bunch of sheep and there's a there's a shepherd tending his flock and what have you, and there's this child and he's just kind of looking over, he's looking over this uh, uh, the, kind of like the edge of this like almost this little drop off, this little cliff, and there's beautiful grasslands and some mountains in the background, right? And then all of a sudden, because you know it's Game of Thrones, it has to happen all of a sudden one of daenerys's dragons just comes 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 just flying up right in front of this kid's face and then just goes just like and just like lays waste and fire so it, excuse me so it can have a little cookout over here and and get some of it obviously the um the shepherd's sheep what this winds up leading into is we see Daenerys sitting on the throne. She's decided to, uh, to, to hold off going to King's Landing and Westeros to take the throne for right now. She's going to just kind of hang out here and see if she can you know, be queen and see what it is. Because you got to remember, she's still a young girl. Okay, She's been getting some, some advice from, from Jorah and for some, for, from uh, Ser Barristan. But for the most part, you know, she's a kid that's lived a very sheltered life, you know, and there's a little bit more to being a queen than just going and doing what you feel like when you feel like, which is what she's done up until now. And although I like her platform as far as the anti-slavery and everything else, we saw in the last episode that in some ways that's come back to bite her in the ass because you can free people from slavery, but unfortunately if you don't put in the systems and controls in place to allow them to continue to be free, all they know is being slaves, so they're very... Uh, they, they can obviously succumb to and, uh, and wind up kind of being taken over again uh, by new masters, which we saw happen, uh, we heard happen in, in one of the other, um, you know, in, uh, in one of the other uh, places that she took over as well. So I don't forget if it was Carth or what. Anyway, so we see her sitting on the throne and she winds up coming in, the, 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 the sheep herder comes in and says, hey, listen, you know, I love you and you're, you're my queen, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she's got the longest amount of titles out of anybody, too, you know. Mother of dragons, free of slaves, breaker of chains, naked of, of, of queens in the first three seasons. And we had all these different titles. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is is that, uh, you know, he winds up saying, listen, you know, you, you took out my, this dragon of yours took out my whole flock, you know. And she's like, well, I can't replace your loss. However, I'll see that you're paid fairly. Uh, as a matter of fact, three times the amount of what, you know, what your, what your sheep would have been worth, your goats, whatever. So the dude's happy with that, right? Well, okay, fine, you know, he's happy. So the next guy that comes in, though, is actually the son of one of the slave masters, the 163 slave masters that she wound up having crucified um, as an, to set an example and to have justice for what they had done to the, the children and whatnot and putting them up on those mileposts, you know? So it was a really cool, tense scene because this guy comes in and uh, and you know and he talks about this and that and his father and everything like that and she's like, oh, your father, I should have been, I should be lucky to meet him and he's like, oh, you have, you 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 crucified him, he's hanging out there, you know. So then she goes and kind of flips her shit and she's like, yeah, well, you know what, it, it, that was done in in retaliation for and to bring justice to those children that were crucified on the way. And what do you have to say about that? And a guy says, and he says, listen, my father was one of the people that spoke out against that. But unfortunately, he was overruled because it was a council type of thing, you know, and uh, where there was popular vote or what have you. And the popular vote said to do that. So what this shows is that it's not easy being a queen. It's not just all about doing what you feel like at the time, because what she did in essence was she went and there was probably some people that were innocent or maybe that did speak out against some of these things or that were less guilty that maybe didn't deserve the type of punishment they had. The bottom line is, for me, is that it shows that there's tough decisions ahead of her if she wants to ever rule any type of kingdom, especially sitting on the Iron Throne. Um, it's not always so clear cut. It's not black and white all the time. It's not just, I'm going to answer injustice with justice. It's not that, you know. And I thought that was nice to kind of have that thrown up in her face because it winds up showing that 
um, that it isn't easy, obviously, ruling over others. And also that, that it, within those tough decisions, you can still be human. You can still be humane. She winds up allowing him to go and take his father down and bury him properly. Because that's all he's asking for, is that if we can keep the traditions of Marine and this and that. And, uh, and he says, listen, you know, you're the queen, you're in power. I'm not denying that, okay? I'm, you know, I'm your humble slave or your servant, whatever you want to call it. But I just want to take my father down and bury him properly in the crypt, you know? So, uh, so that's the whole Daenerys scene, I guess you would say, in a nutshell. And I still thought, I thought it was very well done. So moving right along to King's Landing, which is what uh, the, I would say probably the majority of the episode takes place in. I would say, you know, if I had to if I had to guess, I would say it was about half the time, maybe even a little bit more. And it starts out with a council meeting of the small council, and we have some new members. Obviously, we have uh, Mace Tyrell, and uh, which he seems to be uh, like council paper fetcher, which we'll get to fetcher, uh, which we'll get to in just a minute. And then of course Oberon. And uh, Oberon's great because he's sitting in there. This guy just, man, he just really, he, he just knocks it out of the park every time, right? He just embodies what you would think this sort of just smart-ass type of prince. He's very practical. Um, he's very sharp, you know. He's kind of just chilling with his feet kicked up, relaxing back at the small council meeting. And uh, he's just like, are these things always going to be this early? Because remember, he likes to he likes to get his fuck on, you know, <laughs> boys, girls, whatever, you know. <laughs> He's always up late, probably drinking and, and doing whatever with his little wild orgies. But, uh, so as Tywin walks in, everybody stands up, you know. Varys stands up, and Mace Tyrell stands up, and even Cersei stands up, and everything like that. And I have no idea why she's even still in these small council meetings. She's a has-been, but anyway, um, husband's been dead for a couple years now. One son's dead, the other one's sitting on the throne. She has no place, I think, anywhere in that, that room, but whatever. Um, so anyway, so Oberon doesn't even stand up for Tywin, right? Tywin comes in and, and sits down, everybody sits down, and Tywin, you can see that he's he's running the show. I mean, you knew that to begin with, right? You knew that to begin with, that Tommen was put in place as a figurehead, but Tywin's really the one running the show. And what they wind up talking about in the small council meeting is they bring up uh, uh, the matter of the Hound. Uh, the Hound, you know, had, had killed five of, uh, of, of the king's, you know, uh, of the king's guards, or the, not the king's guards, but, you know, uh, uh, bannermen of the king, king's army men, whatever you want to call them, right? Killed five of them, we know about that. So... Uh, they're going to go and put a price on his head, and Tywin pretty much just says, you know, whatever, make it a, a hundred, hundred gold crowns or what have you, or a hundred silver crowns. Um, so they put a bounty on his head, and then they go in there. You want to have news, a uh, news from news from the east, right, from from Essos about Daenerys and uh, and Varys. This was cool because it was hinted at earlier in season two, uh, I believe it was in season two, yeah. At that, that Jorah Mormont was actually working as a spy for Varys for a, a particular period of time. And Varys says that he no longer is, he's completely loyal now to Daenerys, and he no longer is, uh, is, is a spy for them. Because if you remember, he received a message back right before she was almost poisoned in Season 2, uh, before that, uh, that merchant tried to give her the barrel of wine that was actually poisoned, you know. And, uh, and, and Jorah wound up receiving that message that, you know, you can come back now, you know. So, so he was working as a spy for a while, but then he realized, I guess, that he just believes too much in Daenerys and her actually being the, the rightful heir to the throne, you know, uh, and actually having a birthright and a claim to the throne. So, so that, I thought, was a nice piece of information, but everybody just kind of keeps dismissing, uh, dismissing, and Cersei especially, you know, oh, this little girl over there, what does she have? Well, she's got 8,000 Unsullied. She's got 2,000 Cell Swords from the Second Sons. She's got everybody who's going to come to arms for that she's freed and wants to actually remain free and, and is loyal to her and whatnot. So who knows what she's got. She's got a couple hundred ships. She's got three dragons that are getting pretty big. And I love how Cersei's just like, oh, three baby dragons. And they're like, yeah, getting big. And then Varys is getting larger every year. And, you know, they're trying to say, hey, listen, this is a real legitimate threat, okay? This is this is the real deal. This is a threat, okay? And I like how it was all played out because then Oberyn goes and he's like, you know, the Unsullied are the real deal, you know? I spent some time in Essos and, I mean, they're, they're a fighting force to be reckoned with. And we knew that already. The, the Unsullied are very much like, uh, to me, they remind me very much of like the Spartans, you know? And, um, you know, not to be trifled with, right? So the bottom line that I thought was pretty cool with this this whole scene and how it was played out is there was a couple of really good uh, really good lines in there when they were talking about the hound. Varys winds up going and he's, he goes and and uh, I believe fuck the king came in there somewhere and he says that line you know and that's before they put this bounty on him. But then <laughs> but then you get Tywin who goes and he's just like dragons haven't won a war in three hundred years men win them all the time. 
And I thought that was a great line. That was that was just uh, Ty. When any any line he delivers, I think is great. But uh, but this small council meeting I thought was was very nicely done, and it was just kind of neat to show these new characters and how there's obviously been a little bit of a changing of the guard within this this small council. And then he goes and after he makes this decree, and Tywin's going to do this and that and everything else, he goes and he has <laughs> he has Mace Tyrell going. He says, "Fetch me my pen and quill," you know. <laughs> you're, you know, my, or my my quill and, and paper or whatever, you know. And so, so Mace is basically, you know, he's 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 the stationary, but he's the secretary now, right? He's been given this this, uh, you know, he's been given this spot, this seat at the table, so to speak. But he really has no power. So uh, there's also a scene that I thought was played out very well after that between Prince Oberyn and Varys. And Varys, um, you have these scenes between some of these characters, and it's weird because they're like in the throne room where the, the, the Iron Throne's kind of in the background to kind of symbolize like the power that a lot of these people may be looking for or grasping at. At least that's how I take it. And uh, and Prince Oberyn winds up, you know, Varys asks him about how did he spend much time in Essos, and, uh, you know, Oberyn says five years, and Varys asks him what for. And Oberyn basically just says, he's like, listen, a lot of people grow up in one corner or another of the world. That's where they stay their whole life. It's a big world, you know. I, I like to get out and see things, you know. And um, and then, of course, Varys, you know, says something to the effect of it doesn't hurt that you're a prince either. You know, you pretty much get everything crammed up your ass and what you want. And then it winds up coming out, too, that Varys is asexual and doesn't really prefer boys or girls, even before his, his stuff was taken. I don't know how important that is, but we wind up finding out that Varys really, from what he says... He doesn't have any type of preference with that. That type of stuff only muddles you up. You know, it basically, um, you know, because Oberyn says, well, what is it that, you, that you're that you after or that you want, you know? And Varys, you know, very much, it's he kind of glances at the throne, but I don't think Varys really wants to have any claim to the throne. I think Varys is very much a, he sees the, and he even mentions this, that he sees all the horrible things that these people in power do, right? Because they're entitled and they think they can do them. And I think for him, he truly is just like he said to Ned Stark in the first season. He's a servant of the realm. I think he really, truly, and I mean, he may, he's very smart, though. He's very sly, so I'll give you that. He may have like a little finger type of mass and machination plan going on in the background. But for the most part, I believe that he's very much about, I just like the realm to not be tearing itself apart. It would just be so nice to like not have open rebellion or war somewhere at some point, you know, and just have somewhat of a decent monarchy, you know, going here in the kingdoms, seven kingdoms, right? So the scene again was was portrayed and done very well. The uh, the ending of this episode and and I thought this was done great was actually the trial of Tyrion. And we know that it's going to be a joke and that it's going to be a farce as far as a trial because you've got, you know, Tywin has been looking to do away with his imp son for a long time now, right? And this is the perfect excuse to do away with him as far as I'm concerned. But as this trial starts and people come up and speak against Tyrion, it's really not that hard to believe that he did do this because Sansa has disappeared. You know, his wife is gone, has been whisked away. Master Pycelle or Maester Pycelle comes and talks about how, you know, the events of season two when obviously locked him in the dungeon and everything else. And then there was all these things missing from his poison stores, you know. He has this big list of shit that he was missing and says that of, and accuses Tyrion of taking that, you know, of stealing those things. Cersei testifies about what Tyrion said about, you know, and she keeps using that same line, and, and oh, it will turn your joy will turn to ash in your mouth, and this, and it was a good line, but it's been reused so many times now, and it was just something that Tyrion said because he's awesome and clever, and that's the type of shit that he says, right? Doesn't mean that he's going to do everything that he does, but then even that go uh, that that knight goes, that Sir Sir Marin, I think his name is, winds up going and coming up, the one that. Uh, <laughs> The one that was going, they, they were ripping off Sansa's clothes, and Joffrey had a, uh, a a crossbow pointed at her head, and you know, and, and was torturing her and everything else. And Tyrion walked in when he this is when he was just appointed hand of the king, and you know, put put his cloak over her and got her out of harm's way, and basically just told Joffrey that he's a piece of shit, slapped him around. So they give testimony of that because now, in all fairness, Tyrion did slap around the king quite a bit, you know, and there was a couple of times where he did pretty much just straight out threaten to kill him, you know. <laughs> so. Um, so I, I can see, I guess, how some people would want to go and say, well, this is the guy that did it. But I think the real kicker for me, though, is as this trial goes on and you see, um, first, you know, King Tommen goes and winds up reclusing himself from the whole thing. You know, he basically steps away and says, I'm not going to be a party to this or a witness to it. Uh, you know, my grandfather, my hand of the king uh, is going to take my place and he's going to be one of the three judges. And then we know that Mace Tyrell and Oberyn, Prince Oberyn, are going to be the other two. And there's going to be three judges and, uh, and for this trial. But ultimately, it's a bullshit trial. Tyrion's not allowed to speak when he when when he should be able to speak and defend himself because there's two sides to every story. There's actually three. There's your side, their side, and then there's the truth. You know, 
But what winds up happening is while they take a recess, a break, or what have you, Jamie uh, is absolutely, he's just devastated. He doesn't want to lose his brother, right? So he goes in and he makes a deal with Tywin. And he says, listen, he says, if you kill Tyrion, which is what you're going to, which what you want to do here, I'm going to be Kingsguard for the rest of my life. Who's going to carry on your legacy? Some cousin, some nephew, some nonsensical heir? Who's going to carry on the great Lannister name, right? So Tywin starts listening. He's interested now in listening to him. Jamie says, I'll tell you what, I will go and I will become the Lord of Castle Rock and your heir apparent and I will quit the King's Guard and everything like that because he's been given that out, even though it's a for life type of deal because his hand was cut off and everything he's been through. I think he gets a free pass on that one, right? Um, and I'll do all that, but you have to spare Tyrion's life. So Tywin, without even thinking, he says, done. What we'll do is after the trial, he'll be found guilty, of course, but after the trial, he'll go and hope, you know, if he, if he asks for forgiveness or asks for mercy... Uh, I'll let him go and, and, you know, basically, you know, take the black and, uh, and join the Night's Watch and he can live out his, his days. You will immediately return to Castle Rock. You will do this. You will marry. You will have children that will have Lannister names and you'll stop fucking your sister and you know, all these other sort of things, right? He doesn't say that, but that's what he gets to. And the scene was done very well because Jamie, like I said, I just like the guy more and more, you know, a couple of episodes ago, he's sending Brienne off and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know what's his name? Um, the damn it, I forgot the name of the of the squire or whatever. That he's really funny, Paul Podrick, Podrick, and sends them off to go and try to find Sansa. And uh, you know he's just he's he's a very noble person, and I think this is really his way of trying to go. And I mean he loves his brother and he wants to save him. You know, so I don't know if Tywin saw that coming and he was waiting for it to happen or what, but he agreed to it very quickly. So Jamie comes out there when they're going to re resume the trial, and he, and he whispers everything in Tyrion's ear. And he says, all you got to do is beg for forgiveness and this and that, and beg for mercy. And he says, yeah, Ned Stark was given the same deal, and we saw how that one worked out for him, right? <laughs> and he's like, don't worry, Father will keep his word, blah, blah, blah. So then the bombshell winds up happening in this episode, and I didn't expect this one coming, you know. They go and they call the final witness, and who do they bring in but the most loyal, backstabbing whore in all of Westeros. And I say loyal and backstabbing because Shay, right, was annoying as fuck. She was all right in the second season, but in the third season, she became way too clingy. And at the end of the day, she is a lowborn prostitute. She has been spreading her legs for money for God knows how many years, but she fell in love with Tyrion, and he loved her too, by all accounts. That's why he sent her away. And Brom said that he saw her off, that she's gone, the ship is sailing. She was gone, taking this ship, and she was she was gone, right? Back when the, the episode where, the, where Joffrey was murdered, you know? She comes back to testify, and this backstabbing bitch goes up there and straight up fucking lies. So Cersei and Tywin obviously got to her. Straight up lies and talks about how Sansa and him plotted the murder of the king, and, you know, and how she was she was taken uh, she was actually, you know, with, with one of the other knights of the Lann Lannisters, but that knight was beaten and his arm was broken or some shit, and then she was taken and he was... All these lies, you know, he was... She was paid well for what she did, and the bottom line is that she's a backstabbing whore. That's what she is. She winds up coming into here, and she speaks out against him. She tells all lies of everything that happened. Then she goes into... What I do like is that she goes in and they reuse that line from the second season when he was about to go into battle and he wanted to have her for the night and he said i'll pay you well and you'll have you'll be wealthy beyond all belief but what but all i want you to do is fuck me like it's my last night on this earth you know and so when she says that line right <laughs> prince ober and the pervert's like well did you and she's like what <laughs> what what my lord well did you fuck him like it was his last night on earth and then she goes and she's like, I did everything he wanted. And she basically alludes to any type of perverted thing. I let him put anything wherever. I let him stick his finger up my ass. Whatever. Whatever it is that she came up with. It was all a bunch of lies. It was verbal masturbation that came out of her mouth. And there was no time in Game of Thrones history, even when Joffrey was in a seat, that I just wanted to stab someone in the face more than when I saw her do this. Because now, you know, him being found guilty is one thing, right? It just... But, but I think that it really kills it with her coming in and just straight up lying about this. Because she straight up says that she had inside knowledge to the poisoning and everything else in this whole scheme that they, they came up with. Which is obviously untrue. But So the ending of the episode is just fantastic. Tyrion's like, I wish to confess. I wish to confess. And, and honestly, Tyrion is probably my favorite actor on the show. He is just so powerful and so great. And I couldn't take him seriously at first because of the fact that he's, he's an imp, he's a midget. He just looks 
like adorable half the time because he's only half the size. When he comes into the room, he doesn't have that stature that other people have. And it's nothing against shorter people or, or imps or, or whatever you'd like to call them. It's just that I didn't take him as serious until, I don't know, maybe halfway through the first season, toward maybe towards the end of the first season. And from then on, I just thought this guy had just knocked it out of the park. Says he wishes to confess his sins, right? And then I love it how he just delivers all the lines after that. He winds up, in short, he says that he's uh, he's guilty of being an imp, you know? And he says, and then Tywin says, you're not on trial for being an imp, you know? And he says, yes, I absolutely am. The reason that this has happened is because of this. And he pretty much just calls out his father is that you've just never wanted me, you know, and this is your perfect excuse to get rid of me. And he says, you know, I'm guilty of this, I'm guilty of that. And he says, well, so you, you confess then to, to killing the king, to poison the king? He says, no, I don't. That's one thing that I'm not guilty of. I, but he goes, but I wish that I was this monster that you all paint me up to be. He goes, I saved the city. And he absolutely did. He saved the city. I mean, even Varys testified against him, which I thought was pretty shady. But Varys is always covering his own ass. But it shows that Tyrion truly has no friends now, right? Even though he should, you know. But Tyrion, is, he's really butthurt about this. He's like, I saved the city. I saved all you people. He goes, and to tell you the truth, I wish I hadn't. I wish I had let Stannis come through here and kill every one of you. You backstabbing, cheating, lying mother... You know, he's pissed, right? And I thought it was just a solid performance how he did this because... You know, he just he, he just winds up basically going balls to the wall nuts on them, you know. He's like, I wish that I was this monster. I didn't kill Joffrey, but I certainly wish I did. And he, he basically comes out and says, like, if I had the chance, I would have. You know what I mean? I should have. That's how much I hated that little piece of shit. And it is so nice how he just comes through with this whole, this whole speech. And then at the end of the episode, he says, so you know what? I demand a trial by combat. Now... And then, you know, and then, of course, the scene just the, 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 it goes, it fades to black, and that's the end. They play the music and everything like that. Now, my thoughts and predictions are on this one is that he's obviously going to choose someone to, to go in his stead for the trial by combat. We haven't seen Brahm in several episodes now, in about two or three episodes, I think, since he talked with Jamie. And as far as we know from, from his, his contact uh, with, uh, when he was talking to Paldrick, that Brahm is being kind of looked at as like a co-conspirator, too. So I have no idea what's been happening to Brahm. Uh, if he's been taken into custody, whatever, right? We know at the end of the day, you know, Brom goes where the gold's at, though, right? So I don't know where his loyalty will lie as far as this goes. But this trial by combat, who's he, who's he going to choose as his champion? Is he going to choose Brom? Is he going to choose Jamie? Can he even choose Jamie? Is that a conflict of interest because Jamie's the king's guard? I have a feeling, though, that he's going to wind up choosing Brom uh, as his, you know, as his proxy or whatever to go and fight as his, as his, uh, you know, for his trial by combat as his champion. And then I have a feeling that Tywin in the realm will wind up going and choosing Jaime. Uh, and even though he's like, so I think, I just think it might happen because of the fact that I haven't read ahead. I don't read the books or anything like that. So I don't know what happens. And I know they changed some things anyway. But Jaime and Brom, especially, it would be so uh, ironic and so poetic at the same time because Brom has been teaching Jaime how to fight and how to fight to win, how to fight dirty if he needs to with his one hand. And I think that would just be an awesome uh, battle. But all in all, though, a great episode. Uh, probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite so far in the series. And I say that almost every week now, but it's just like it just keeps compounding upon itself and there's just the greatness that is this show. Uh, just so good, so well done. And uh, certainly my episode question for you, though, brothers and sisters, is who do you think will be chosen uh, by Tyrion as his champion? And who do you think that that champion will fight against? I'd like to hear your theories and thoughts in the comments down below. Feel free to hit the thumbs up, the like button if you should think that I deserve it, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. We will look forward to catching all of you in the next one, nation. Do you think Stannis will take back the Iron Throne? Remember to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and even my other channel, 